Thank you, gentlemen, singing such a beautiful, beautiful hymn of praise to our Savior. It is good to see all of you here fellowshipping in the presence of our great God. Before we proceed, just a quick reminder, let us make sure our cell phones or any other distractions are out of the way so that we can take time one more to look back. This year, it's exactly 180 years since 1844. And right now, for this evening's message, we're going to look specifically at what those early Millerites were looking forward to. In contrast with a message that many evangelicals, many Protestants are promoting. And hence the title for my message this evening is The Rapture or the Return. Remember I've been mentioning that in the morning service we look at a Bible story, something that is more simple, a story you may have heard before, lessons from the scriptures. In the evenings it's like coming to night school, you know what I mean, right? We dig a little deeper, we reflect, we go back. And that's why we have been encouraging you to think about this passage that reads as follows. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Life Sketches, page 196, paragraph 2. Now thus far, in these special evening meetings, you'll notice I have placed before you a challenge. The challenge has been quite simple. It's a rhyme, actually. It has a double rhyme. It says, know the roots, grow the fruits. And so we have reflected the first time we looked back at 1844, we looked at the issue of the sanctuary, which was when that ministry of Jesus, a focus is always on Jesus, began on October 22, 1844, in the heavenly sanctuary. That's what we looked at on Sabbath evening. On August 11, we reflected on how did those early Millerites know for sure that 1844, the year day principle, the way to calculate the 2300 day year prophecy of Daniel chapter 8 verse 14 was accurate and we looked at that and we realized that 1840, this was the support, the prophecy that proves 1844 is the correct year, correct day, and so forth. And then, of course, yesterday we reflected on the challenge that was raised about the scriptures, the translation of the Bible into many languages so that people could read the Word of God, the scriptures that always point to Jesus Christ, our Savior. We looked at that just last evening. For tonight, I have a question for you to think about. Now, notice... This is a little bit of a trick question, so I'm warning you, all right? Here's the question. What is the day, notice the language, the day that changed the world? Hmm. I know some people automatically go back to that traumatic day for many, many Americans, and of course there were foreigners as well in the Twin Towers that was attacked by terrorists on the 11th of September, 2001. Most Americans refer to it as 9-11 because in the United States, they mention the month first, then the day. So they talk about 9-11. Now those who are older, decades older, will go back as my mother-in-law. She remembers what happened when the Japanese flew in with their bombers and drop bombs there in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. And they look back at that time, which was what got the United States involved in the Second World War. And the reason my mother-in-law remembers it, it was on her birthday. She never forgot that as a child. December 7, 1942, if I remember correctly. Now, I wasn't even born, so, but you read it in the history books. Some people think of these days as the day that changed the world. 
But you see, when you are a Seventh-day Adventist, when you are a Protestant, when you believe in the proper methodology of interpreting apocalyptic prophecies, prophecies that point to the time of the end, those kinds of prophecies, notice the phrase, the day that changed the world. Aha! So when we talk about 2,300 days, we are referring to 2,300 years. Therefore, what's the logic now? What would be the day that changed the world? What would be the day, in quotes, that changed the world? I'm waiting for the answer. 1844, you're correct. I said it's a kind of a trick question, but it's not really, because you know your Bibles. You know the way that prophecy is given. And why do I say that? Now, the first aspect of this concept of the day, in quotes, that changed the world, takes us back to those Millerites who, when they discovered the actual timing of this event, they thought it was the second coming of Jesus. We now know that they were wrong. We'll get to that in a minute. But this was the appeal they sent out. They said, and read it with me. Are you ready? Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Time is short. Get ready. Get ready. And as you well know from the study of history and from the messages I've been sharing here by the grace of God, they were there watching, waiting expectantly. October 22, 1844 came with great expectation and they were met with great disappointments. In retrospect, as we look back, we realize correctly that they had the right date, but they misunderstood the event which is one of the reasons we are reflecting here on the special sanctuary message. Because as those early Millerites, Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Church of Christ, many different denominations, there was no Seventh-day Adventist church. You know that. The Seventh-day Adventist church started some decades later. Maybe about uh, almost 20 years later, the Seventh-day Adventist church started. But these Christians who were serious Bible students as they reflected on this great disappointment, they began to understand that Jesus is our advocate. The good news is that the Bible shows that the judgment will be made, notice, quoting now from Daniel chapter 7, verse 22, in favor of the saints of the Most High. What do you say? That's good news, is it not? This is very good news. Very good news. You know, I know sometimes we... we almost are in fear of the judgment. But let me share with you a practical story. It happened to me personally many years ago. I had the opportunity to teach at Southern Adventist University, there in Tennessee, one of our Seventh Adventist universities. And one day, in between classes, I was a professor there, and I was trying to get to an appointment to, or to get something quickly between classes. I knew I had very little time, and so I rushed out to go and get that. And as I was going in my car, and I had a student with me, I was teaching theology there at Southern Adventist University, and I was driving towards, there was a T-junction. You know what a T, you're driving, and then there's a road that goes this way, right? And as I was approaching the T-junction, naturally, as you would all expect, there would be a stop sign for me, right? It's a T-junction. But when I looked, I noticed there was a long line of traffic, cars coming. And I thought, oh no, I'm in a hurry. I've got to get to this thing to get it and get back to the classroom. But I noticed a gap as I was driving toward, I'm driving towards the T-junction, I saw a gap in the, in the cars, and I realized if I stopped, I wouldn't make it to get into the gap. So guess what I did? I came towards the stop sign, never stopped, and I managed to slip into that gap between the cars. Relief for a moment. Because it just so happened about three or four cars behind the gap was one of those friendly men in a car that has those wonderful lights on top. You know what I'm talking about. 
And immediately I noticed the lights started flashing, but he was going the opposite direction. I was going this way, he was going that way. And for a moment, a crazy thought crossed my brain. Yes, I was a, a professor, but I thought, let's put the foot on the pedal on the, and let's make a run for it. I need to get away from this policeman now that I have been caught doing something illegal. But you know, I had a student with me. I had to be a good example. <laughs> and uh, so, sure enough, that policeman turned around with his lights flashing and he came and he pulled me over. He said, uh, you did not stop at the stop sign. Here is the ticket I'm going to write. Take it. And if you want to appeal this, you have to show up in court and go talk to the judge. The student didn't say anything. I didn't tell my wife. <laughs> the court date came. My wife didn't know. I went to the court alone. I had never been in court before. And so I was sitting there, and after a while they called my name. And I came, stood up, and I said, yes, sir. And he said, how do you plead? How do you plead? Guilty or not guilty? I thought, uh-oh, I came all the way to the court to do what? Just to say guilty? I may as well pay the, the fine, right? So I said, uh, uh, your honor, can I approach the desk? I had seen it on television. I had no idea what I was doing, but can I approach the desk, your honor? So I came up here and he said, yes, what? He said, do you plead guilty or not guilty, your honor? What do you mean guilty? He said, how, what happened? I said, I came to a rolling stop. <laughs> you know what a rolling stop is. He said, a rolling stop, that is not a stop. How do you plead? Because you did not stop. I said, I plead guilty, Your Honor. But, 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 but Your Honor, can I please talk to you? And I came very quietly, and I pulled out my driver's license, and I said, Your Honor, Please look at my license. Look on the back in the United States when you've been stopped and you've been in trouble. They've got all kinds of marks on the back. I say, Your Honor, my driving record is clean. He looked at my license. said, yes, it is clean. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to put you on probation. For the next six months, if you have no offenses, not even a parking ticket, I will ignore this offense that you've done. However, if you have anything that you have done wrong, <laughs> you're in trouble, big trouble. <laughs> You'll have to pay for that, pay for this. And because you wasted our time today, you have to pay court costs, but, but there'll be no fine for not stopping at that junction I left the court oh so happy and guess what happened because I was on probation I had basically been forgiven what did I do ah from that moment on for the next six months I drove like a saint my wife had no idea what had happened to her husband when I saw the light turn orange, I began to apply the brake instead of applying the petrol to get through the traffic light. You understand, through the robot, uh, every stop sign, I slowed down with gentleness. She didn't understand how it was that her husband had gone through such a dramatic change. <laughs> but you see, the judge was wise. The judge was wise because within six months, I had formed new habits. I had formed new practices. Why? You see, I had been forgiven by a wise judge. I knew I was living under probation. And because I was under the probation of a forgiving judge, my habits, my character were going through a similar change. Think about us. Are we living in the time of probation? We, have we been forgiven by Jesus Christ? How much more should our lives not reflect the way that we should live for His glory?
Of course, my wife heard the story when I preached it one day. That's the safest way to do it, pastors. <laughs> yes, she's forgiven me, obviously. God is good, isn't he? Amen. But of course, 1844 came, and we now understand, looking back, that starting then, Daniel chapter 7, verse, we just read verse 12, judgment was given, how? In favor of the saints. But not everybody was happy. The being that was most unhappy, this is the artist's impression, this was Lucifer. He knew, of course, the Bible, the, Bible, the, the devil knows the Bible, as you could expect, so that he can twist it, so that he can try to fight against God's word. And so what did he do? Incredibly, incredibly, the devil began to find ways to distract from this important movement, the Millerite movement, looking at October 22 and later realizing this was a momentous event that was happening in the course of heaven, the beginning of the antitypical day of atonement, the sanctuary message. That's what we are talking about here. And so what did he do? I believe it was the devil himself who inspired one gentleman, his name was Friedrich Engels, to go and meet his friend in Paris. And there's a big statue of these two men. Friedrich Engels, in the summer of 1844, on his way back from Manchester to go to his home in Germany, Friedrich Engels stopped in Germany to, uh, stopped in Paris rather, to visit with a man by the name of Karl, what do you think his family name was? Karl Marx. And guess what? 1844, the summer of 1844, according to historians, is the beginning of socialism and communism. Isn't that interesting? The very time when people around the world were proclaiming the coming of Jesus, along came socialism and communism, and they promoted and claimed, if you follow our political system, our concept of government, we promise you a utopia. We promise you a, a place of peace. But it was a false utopia. We know that as we look back. In fact, we know even though, uh, as Ronald Reagan, the 44th president of the United States, if I remember the right numbers, he called upon uh, Gorbachev. He said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. That is the wall in Berlin. And of course, the Berlin Wall did come down. And they say that many people who were living under communism were freed. However, don't forget, to this day, we know that there are more than a billion or 1,000 1, million, the way the British say, still living under oppression in communist China, in Cuba, in North Korea. People are still living under communism. A false attempt to provide a peaceful place in contrast to a focus on the coming of Jesus because he alone can give us peace, what do you say? That's right. Now, not only did the devil inspire an outside political movement to try to counter the good news of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus, he also began to work through this gentleman who was actually a preacher. Notice I didn't say a Bible student, I said a preacher. He was living in Europe as well, and he began to teach something unusual. Now, I had the opportunity to live right there near Andrews University several years ago. I was a pastor in Berrien Springs, the very town where Andrews University is located. I had a chance to go to the library, many, opp many opportunities, and so digging deep there, and I found something interesting, reading the books of the people who call themselves dispensationalists. And they tell us that it was, notice the timing, they don't know the exact time, but they said it was somewhere between 1842 and 1844 that John Nelson Darby introduced what is called the secret rapture theory. Notice, before 1844, Christians did not believe in the secret rapture. The secret rapture that is globally believed by many people when they claim that suddenly, without expectation, people will just disappear. Yes, this has become a very popular theory. And even non-Christians believe what Christians claim about this, so much so that Newsweek, one of the major magazines in the United States many years ago, 
had a picture of these two men, and they called them the new prophets, P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S, of Revelation. Okay, Jerry Jenkins and Tim LaHaye. They, they began a series called the Left Behind series. Some of you may have heard of this. They've made movies about this. They promote that suddenly, without any expectation, people will just disappear and, and, and supposedly go to heaven. And it's become very popular. Tens of millions of books have been sold promoting this theory. Now, I have not purchased those books, but one day I was somewhere when I came across this book published by the same two writers. Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins. And the title of the book caught my attention because I'm a Bible student, okay? And it says, are we living in the end times? And I thought, this is interesting. So I opened the book, I began to look, and in the book they say, this book is not like the fictional ideas of the Left Behind series where they have kind of a historical novel. They mix truth with just their own ideas. They say, this book is what we believe the Bible actually teaches. Of course, I was interested. I bought the book. I still have it in my library because I thought I need to read what they say they believe the Bible teaches. And it goes all the way back to that other man I mentioned that came up with the idea of the secret rapture between 1842 and 1844, John Nelson Darby. So sure enough, very interesting. Now, please notice, some of the ideas in this book are in full alignment what we, with what we as Adventists believe, such as the statue of Daniel in Daniel chapter 2, with Babylon, Medo-Persia, Grecia, Rome, etc. So there are things in it that we believe are biblically and historically accurate. However, there are some very interesting theories and I will read to you right now what they claim. Number one, they say at any moment, God's faithful will go to heaven. There are no signs that predict it at all. The saints are safe in heaven and won't suffer persecution. Now, we as Adventists believe the Bible talks about a time of trouble such as never was, that faithful people will have to endure by God's grace. They say, no, no, don't worry. <laughs> the saints will never suffer that persecution. Number one. Number two, if you miss the rapture going to heaven, then comes the tribulation, the time of trouble, but you will have a what? Second chance to be saved. Wow. Now, now that is very enticing. Because you can say, you know what, I'm going to have fun, quote unquote. Like some young people think, I will go and drink alcohol and beer and I can do whatever I want. And then I'll wait till I see people go to heaven, I'll have a second chance. You see that? Very dangerous theory. Very dangerous theory. And not true at all. But, but, but listen, this is in that book called Are We Living in the End Times? They say, if you are still not saved after the trumpet at Jesus' second coming. Do not worry, for you will have a what? Third chance to be saved. When will this happen? This will be during the first 100 years of the millennium. Wait a minute. First 100 years of... Yes, these are some of the dangers of the rapture theory that is being promoted widely by Christians, Protestants, evangelicals, strange ideas. But don't miss the point. When was this idea of a false concept of the second coming, when was it introduced? Around the same time. The very time of 1844. Interesting. We have to be very careful with theories and ideas that are being spread. Let's think for a moment about the concept of Armageddon. Even amongst some Adventists, there is confusion. And if you read the, even some of the the discussions in some of Adventist books of the past, there was some confusion. Some people thought that uh, one of the, the, this World War, First World War, Second World War, maybe Armageddon. No. If you study the Bible carefully, you will discover that Armageddon is a clash of good and evil, spiritually speaking. All right? Armageddon is a spiritual conflict against those loyal to God's law. Armageddon is not a physical conflict between one country and, not, and another. It is not the Third World War some people may want to claim. No, no, no. It's not that kind of battle. It's a spiritual conflict. 
And that is what Adventists correctly recognize. And so this evening as we reflect, we're going to ask the question, which signs really do precede the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to go through this slowly. Some of that you already know. It's a good reminder. For some of you, it may be new. I know some of the signs may sound like old. Yes, but we have to recognize what does the Bible teach? So which signs? Let's first talk about historical events. As, the, as predicted in Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. A well-recognized one was the Lisbon earthquake, that great earthquake in 1755. Another one was what's called the Dark Day and the Bloody Moon, 1780, also from the book of Revelation, and the amazing falling of the stars in the year 1833. And I don't know some of you are saying, but past that is oh, almost as far back, almost 200, 250, 260 years ago. But we know that the Bible did predict that. And we want to recognize the prediction and the fulfillment of these historical signs, historic events as predicted in the book of Revelation, as recognized by many people. In fact, if you look at the timeline, during this time, 1755, 1780, 1833, there was no Seventh Avenue Church. This was recognized by other Christians. Some of these facts have been completely forgotten. The falling of the stars, as I mentioned before, they estimate there were 60,000 shooting and falling stars per hour. Have you ever watched a shooting star or a falling star? If you see one or two at night, you say, wow, imagine seeing 60,000 in one hour. Amazing event. That was the first uh, factor that we are thinking about the historical events that were fulfilled. Number two, we want to consider in Matthew 24, verses 37 to 39, reflecting back to Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 12, which was the time of the flood, we realize the Bible talks about the evil, saturated hearts of humankind and violence that will fill the earth before the time of the end. And we are living in those days clearly. You know that. If you especially think about countries where there are mass murders happening, I lived, by the way, in Arizona a few years ago when in Las Vegas, the well-known city there in Nevada, one man with, mach with kind of machine guns was sitting in his hotel room and he was shooting at the gr a group of people attending a concert. He managed to kill that within a few minutes. Sixty people he killed. One of the largest mass murders murders in U.S. history. Violence is happening all over. We, we can just look at that. The news is full of the violence, which, by the way, is one of the other signs of the coming of Jesus. Number two, let's continue now. Back to the words of Jesus in Matthew 24, verse 24. He says, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elects. Those are some of the things that we know Scripture has predicted and has been happening and has been coming true. But there's a caution because sometimes people try to predict when Jesus will come. A few days ago, I shared with you that massive timeline that was created by somebody who calls himself a Seventh-day Adventist. He started way back at the time when the Israelites uh, the best date we have crossing over into Canaan, and he has predicted that Seventh-day Adventists, people who love, who love the Lord, people who believe in Jesus, will go to heaven into the spiritual Canaan, guess when? In 2024. This is the prediction. And he posted this online about three years ago. He claims that this is the year we will go to heaven. But here's the caution. The Bible says very clearly of that day and hour, no one knows. So do not set dates. Also, many confuse the signs of Jerusalem's fall with the end of the world. We must not confuse when we get to Matthew chapter 24. We must recognize there's predictions about the fall of Jerusalem and predictions about the end of the world. So the question we want to ask this evening and remind you of it, what does the Bible teach about what the, re about what the return of Jesus will be like? 
Thank you, sister, for reading that beautiful passage from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 11, verse 1. She read in our hearing, and I'm now looking at the passage from the New King James Version that says, This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. When we look at texts such as these, we recognize that Jesus' return will be personal and literal. No secret rapture. No people just disappearing. The return of Jesus will be personal and literal. It's one event. Very important. So Acts chapter 1 verse 11. This same Jesus will come in like manner, personal and literal. Of course, in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 7, we are reminded, behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him. Of course, what we mean by that, it will be a visible coming to every eye. Personal, literal, visible all right. So as we look at the many passages that talk about the coming of Jesus, we recognize we have to be very careful not to be deceived by the theories, by the popular views that are promoted out there. The scriptures continue. This one from 1 Thessalonians. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump, trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. In other words, it'll be audible with lots of sound, nothing secret about it. It'll be noisy if you want to use that word. You will hear things happening. No secret rapture, no sudden disappearance of people. Let's read our scriptures very, very carefully. Matthew chapter 24, verse 30, the words of Jesus, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Okay, and of course, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, in the contemporary English version, captures the same kind of concept. The day of the Lord's return will surprise us like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a loud noise and the heat will melt the whole universe. The earth and everything on it will be seen for what they are. In short, it will be, and a large word here, a cataclysmic event, like a massive earthquake with a tsunami. And Matthew 24, verses 42 to 44, says it will be sudden. Oh, lots of information. Our Bibles have told us this. We have to be very careful so that we don't get distracted by many voices that have come up with theories that are not based upon the Holy Scriptures. I've given you just some of the passages. This is not everything. You can find more in Scripture as we read carefully. So what are the implications of all this? What does this teach us? What should we do in our personal lives? And once again, I'm going to invite you to read one of our favorite passages where Jesus speaks to his disciples in John chapter 14, verse 1 through 3. Let us read together. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So the first implication is, don't worry, friends. Trust in God. Don't worry. Trust in God. Don't live in fear of the future. Live by faith in the Father. I repeat, don't live by fear of the future. Live how? By faith in the Father. Lesson, first implication. Second implication comes from Matthew 24, verse 44. The words of Jesus. Therefore, you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Hence, be ready when? Always. 
always, absolutely. And here I need to share a brief story of my sister. In the morning meeting, I showed you a picture of myself with a kind of a lot of hair on my head, remember? All right? And my family, my mother, my father, my sister, and her three children. My sister was 25 years of age with three children. The youngest was one, the next was three, the next was five. When suddenly, while she was at church during the week, she felt sick. As she rushed towards the restroom, she collapsed at the door. My cousin, who was the pastor, rushed over to give her first aid to help her as much as possible. They picked her up, they rushed her to the nearest hospital, and they were in a fight to save her life. And by the grace of God, her life was spared. They rushed her then to the major place where they could take care of her in the city of Durban, South Africa. My parents hurried down from Johannesburg where we were living, as I mentioned today earlier. My mom and dad went down to visit my sister. I had to remain there to go and cancel my dad's appointments because he had some engagements that weekend. This was suddenly, unexpectedly. Mom and dad went down to visit my sister Pam. Pamela was her full name. After three or four days, my parents returned coming back, and as I told you, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't even have a landline in our apartment. It took a year and a half to get a landline. You had to apply and wait patiently. And I remember when mom and dad came back, I said to them, how is my sister? Because I loved my sister. They said, oh, good news. She is doing well. Oh, praise God. Oh, we were feeling so good. We went to sleep that night. I think it was a Tuesday. We were sleeping well when I heard Around 12.30, 1 o'clock in the morning, and again, knocking on the door. And so I got up. I was, I was sleeping in the, in the living room. It was a small flat or apartment we were living in. I was living with my parents in my mid-20s, as I shared with you this morning. And I went to the door, and I opened the door half asleep, and I noticed my cousin there, the brother of the pastor, where my sister was attending church where she was active. And I looked at my cousin and I said to him, Irvin, how are you doing? He said, is your mom and, are your mom, mom and dad, are they here? I said, yes, yes, yes. And I was so groggy, half asleep, I had no idea. Why would my cousin Irvin, the brother of the pastor, be knocking on the door around one o'clock in the morning? You know, your brain is not functioning, right? I had just gotten the good news that my only sister whom I loved was doing well. So I said, yes, they are in the bedroom and woke, woke them up. And my cousin Irvin went in and shared the devastating news. My sister had had a second stroke at the age of 25 while she was in the hospital and she had died. Three children left behind. And I heard my mom and dad especially crying, crying. They had driven all the way back 500 kilometers from the hospital down in Durban back to Johannesburg and given me the good news. Little did they know, because there were no cell phones back then, little did they know as they were driving back. That was when my sister had a second stroke. A blood a vessel had burst in her brain and she had died. But thank God, while my mother and father were visiting my sister Pam, she had said to them, Mom, Dad, if anything happens to me, would you please take care of the three children? You see, sadly, her husband was a nominal Seventh-day Adventist. He was an SDA by name, but not by practice. And she said, would you please look after my children and raise them for me because I know that my husband really will not do that. And more importantly, she said to my parents, don't worry about me because I love Jesus. And if anything happens, I trust by God's grace, I will be in the kingdom. And so there was this joy despite the sadness because my sister believed in being ready, what? That's right, thank God. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
His own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. That's what we are told about, about us as believers. In brief, as we mentioned before, found in that book called Ministry of Healing, page 102, paragraph 4, every, read with me, every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. Let's read it again. Every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. Wow. You and I have a wonderful opportunity to share the love of God, to share with people about the imminent return of our precious Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm going to share with you now a tragic story, a more than tragic story that many of you had probably never heard about before. Yes, many of you may know the general information about that day that many Americans and people from other countries recognize as a tragic time when those two planes struck the two towers. The North Tower was struck first at 8.46 a.m. on Tuesday, September 11, 2001. About 15, 20 minutes later, the South Tower was struck by another airplane. Two airplanes, two towers. Now the curious thing is, the plane that struck the North Tower struck it first. But what tower collapsed first? It was the South Tower. And that is a documented evidence. Now what was interesting, sometime after the towers had collapsed, some serious journalists began to interview people, survivors of the collapse of the Twin Towers. And they wrote a book called 102 Minutes. It was 102 minutes from the time that the first plane had struck the North Tower and then the South Tower collapsed after the second plane hit it until the North Tower collapsed second. Are you following? So the North Tower was struck first and it collapsed last. And in between, the South Tower was struck and collapsed first. So 102 minutes from the, when the first plane struck the North Tower until the North Tower ultimately collapsed. 102 minutes. That is the title of the book. The book caught my attention. The subtitle was interesting. The untold story of the fight to survive inside the Twin Towers. A fascinating and scary and sad story. Now, as I was telling you, the second, the South Tower was struck second. Remember, when the towers got struck by those airplanes, there were firefighters who arrived at these towers to try to come and rescue people. And the, and the firefighters, okay, because the towers were so high, they couldn't use hoses to try to put the fire out. It was way too high. During the time of fire, as you well know, they do not operate the lifts or the elevators. So the firefighters had to carry all their firefighting gear step by step up floor after floor after floor. And they were climbing the North Tower. This is one of the stories shared in this book. They went up in the North Tower, climbing up. Now, there were three officials that were already high up in the North Tower. They were, they were there, people who were apparently were ahead of the firefighters. I believe they were working in the, in the North Tower. And they were then told on their walkie-talkies, look at what happened in the South Tower. The one that got struck second, it is now collapsing. And so they told these officers in the North Tower, three of them, they said, come down as quickly as, as you can. Run down those steps. Get out of the North Tower. And so these officers that were very high in the North Tower began to hurry, hurry down to come down to the ground floor to, to get out 
of the North Tower because the people outside said the South Tower has collapsed and it looks like the North Tower may also collapse soon. So get out, get out. And so as these three officers were coming down, guess who they passed, who were, had been coming up? Who do you think? The firefighters. The firefighters had actually decided to stop and take a break. And they stopped on the, maybe the 50th or the 60th floor. There were like, I think, 90 floors or whatever going up. They stopped on one floor and there were about 200 firefighters that stopped to catch their breath. They were tired from walking up these many f flights of stairs. And so these three officers, as they came down, they looked and here were, sit were sitting, relaxing, about 200 firefighters. And so these men were coming with their walkie-talkies said, folks, we've just got news. The South, Tire has, South, Tiver, the South Tower has collapsed. And the people outside have warned us that the North Tower appears to be in a precarious condition, which will also collapse. And we have been told we must get out as fast as we can. And the firefighters turned to these three men and said, don't worry about us. Don't worry about us. We can take care of ourselves. Don't worry about us. And those firefighters continue to rest. And those three men escaped. Not one of those firefighters survived. Now, I'm not trying to minimize firefighters. Please, no. Thank God for firefighters. Are we together? What was the problem here? The firefighters ignored the warning. The firefighters were arrogant. Don't worry about us. We can take care of ourselves. The warning signs were all there. The South Tower had collapsed. The North Tower was in danger of collapsing and did collapse. And hundreds of firefighters perished when they could have been saved. Are you hearing me? The danger of self-assurance, the danger of arrogance. The story, one under two minutes, is a devastating tale of people who could have survived if only they had heeded the warning. But that's not the only story that comes from the North Tower. Remember the South Tower had collapsed? The people outside were warning, get out, get out. Now, what had happened when that plane had hit the North Tower? You can see on the video, it had come in at an angle. And in the angle that the plane had come in, it had struck almost the center of the North Tower, not the complete center. And the lifts, the elevators, were in the center. And, of course, the elevators as well as the escape stairway. The fire escape was right in the middle. But that plane had come in at an angle and had destroyed one set of stairs. The other set of stairs had survived. Unfortunately, many people had been going up above the point of contact. They were trying to get up to the highest point where there was a door they were trying to get up onto the roof. And when they got there, the door was locked. It was sealed. They could not get beyond the door onto the roof. They were hoping to get to the roof where they thought they could be rescued by helicopter. And they went up only, listen carefully, 18, less than 20 people, as I recall from this book that I read several years ago, less than 20 people discovered that stairwell that was not severed by the crashing plane. Yes, there was some rubble, some bricks and so forth, whatever there, but they were able to go down that stairwell from above the point of impact. They were above it. They managed to go down the route of escape that they had found. And everyone else above that perished when the North Tower collapsed. Hundreds more, many hundreds of people. Now, those people who died, they didn't die because of arrogance. They died because of what? Ignorance. Ignorance. They didn't know that there was a way of escape.
When you read this sad story, hundreds of people perished. Some because of arrogance. We can save ourselves. Others because of ignorance. They didn't know that there was a way of escape. My brothers, my sisters, friends, those watching online, or perhaps viewing this later, Jesus has told us there are going to be signs before his coming. The Bible has many clear evidences that we are living in the time of the end. And the danger for all of us are the twin dangers. The dangers of arrogance and the dangers of Ignorance. And we have the opportunity as the, we are the people who believe in the second coming of Jesus. It's in our very name. We are called Seventh day what? Adventists. We have a wonderful opportunity to go and tell people about the second coming of Jesus. And so, my simple question is this to you today to you Are you looking for the blessed hope? and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I heard one person say yes. Maybe I should ask that one more time. Are you looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ? Wonderful. If you are, then you and I must make sure that we go out and tell others about Jesus. Let's go out and share with them the imminent return of our Savior. In our series for the evenings, we've been encouraging with this personal commitment to know the roots. That is, that Jesus is coming again and to grow the fruits. That is, to joyfully tell others of Jesus coming. And so in these closing moments, I'm going to ask, and I want us to think about that beautiful song. You may know it by heart. It's called Lift Up the Trumpet and Loud Let It Ring. I believe it's in our hymnal number 213 or 214, if I recall. I'm going to ask if we can sing that song together. It's not actually planned ahead. I just feel impressed for us to sing that. Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is what? Coming again. And as we're going to be singing that song, after every stanza, I'm going to ask our song leaders to pause, not to keep singing, because we're going to make an appeal to those of you who want to come to the front. As you know, Sabbath will be coming in just a four or five days here. And we're going to be encouraging you, inviting you. If you have not made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ, if you have perhaps made a commitment but have slipped away, if you want to be baptized, if you want to do that, we're going to ask you as we stand right now, we're going to sing the song, we're going to invite you to come up to the front to make that public commitment to Jesus Christ. Let us stand as we sing this beautiful hymn, coming again, coming again. Jesus is coming again. Singing. Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Cheer up, ye pilgrims, be joyful and sing. Jesus is coming again. Coming again, coming again. Jesus is coming again. I'm going to pause right there and ask if there's anybody else who wants to come forward. Please come. I'm glad to see you bringing your prayer requests. But in addition to your prayer requests, we're going to invite you, those of you who would like to make a personal commitment, who would love to be baptized this Sabbath, please come and join us here. Our pastors are here waiting 
for you to come up. And now we will begin the second stanza. Echo it, hilltops, proclaim it, ye plains. Come join us on the platform. Singing. Sing. Echo it, hilltops, proclaim it, ye plains. Jesus is coming again. Coming in glory, the Lamb that was slain. Jesus is coming again. Coming again, coming again. Jesus is coming again. Before we sing our next stanza, we're going to again invite, is there anyone else who wants to come up here to join us? We have some more time. We're not wanting to rush the decision, but we know some of you have been studying the Bible. Some of your hearts have been uh, impressed during the course of the camp meeting, wonderful speakers sharing wonderful messages. So we're going to invite you, if God is impressing you, to come forward during the singing of the next stanza. Heavings of earth tell the vast wandering throng. Singing. Sing. Heavings of earth tell the vast wandering throng. Jesus is coming again. Tempest and wild winds, the atom prolong. Jesus is coming again. Coming again. Coming again. Jesus is This morning I shared with you my own personal journey, how I was raised in a Seventh-day Adventist family, and yet I studied theology to be a pastor. I knew the doctrines, but I didn't know the Jesus of the doctrine. I don't know if there's one, two, or more of you here that may say, Pastor, I'm like you. <laughs> I know the teachings, but I don't know the teacher. I know what the Bible tells us, but I don't know the living God. If there's one or two who wants to come up for this Sabbath to make that personal, public recommitment to our Savior Jesus Christ, as we sing our next stanza, I'm going to invite you to come forward to make that decision for Jesus our Savior. Sing. Nations are angry by this we do know. Jesus is coming again. Knowledge increases, men run to and fro. Jesus is coming again. Coming again. Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he is coming again. Thank you for those who've come up to the platform, who are making a public commitment, who want to make that major step forward to be baptized, to follow in the footsteps of the Master. And Lord, I know your Holy Spirit is currently still working on hearts, maybe even some online, maybe some watching this later on. I pray that every heart on which the Spirit works will respond so that by your grace there will be many souls in the kingdom. Help us not to be like those who perished in the Twin Towers. Some perished because of arrogance, some because of ignorance. Help us to make the right decision at the right time for your glory in the precious name of Jesus that all God's saints say, Amen.